Death is a surprise party. Following up the fantastic sequel that was Saw 2, Saw 3 manages to take the groundwork set out from its predecessors and brilliantly finish off the continuing story of John Kramer, taking an emotional turn, resulting in a film that is slower, grimmer, and more intimate than any of the other Saw films. The tonal shift to these somber places results in a film that feels so unique to the franchise, yet affectionately connects and gives more context to the previous two films. Saw 3's story has a heavy focus on the human emotions, specifically those of loss and forgiveness. The script, penned by Lee Winnell, with James Wan joining back, gives Tobin Bell and Shawnee Smith a lot to work with, who in turn provide deep insight into their characters with two outstanding performances. Despite Saw 3's grim story and graphic imagery, it's clearly a product of love and adoration for the story and the characters. The story covers new ground, provides insight into established character histories, and develops the Saw universe in unexpected ways. And it's a refinement that makes sense after the leap from Saw 1 to Saw 2. Just as Saw 2 built on the strengths of Saw, Saw 3 takes the cerebral muscle and vastness of Saw 2 and distills it into something far more visceral, precise, and uncompromisingly cruel than either of the previous films. Here, we're given the series' foreshadowing of fate lines played to this tragedy that can't be matched by any of the other entries in the Saw franchise. The story is just so deftly woven, so heavy with maturation and meaning. The relational development between Amanda and John, the untold relational links between them and the film's other two leads, Jeff and Lynn, and Amanda's own perdition especially, as a woman, a follower, and a student, veritably drawn and quartered by the weights of her grief, doubt, shame, and love. One area where Saw 3 actually tops Saw 2 is giving us new characters that we actually care about. With seven characters put through Jigsaw's trap, plus the Detective Matthews plot stealing some time, there wasn't much time to understand them and get invested into their scenes. Here, however, we have ample time with Jeff and Lynn, getting to know important bits of what makes them tick throughout the story's progression. After the ensemble cast of Saw 2, Saw 3's narrowed, intimate focus and intentionality really hit the highest marks, allowing the film to build a monstrous, slow burn intensity until it hits the twist ending crescendo just so pitch perfectly excruciating and horrific. It's also helped by two fantastic performances from Bahar Sumek and Angus McFadden, who sell their desperation and their respective characters so well. Tobin Bell is of course back as Jigsaw, and despite laying relatively dormant throughout the film, shows he is still the perfectly conniving villain who is always multiple steps ahead of anyone else. But the true star of this film is without a doubt Shawnee Smith as Amanda. She's a character that has had such an interesting narrative arc and journey so far. But above all, what makes Saw 3 stand out for me is that the story was written as a proper sequel, rather than adapting another script into a Saw film. This time, Juan returns with Winnell, giving them the opportunity to weave in threads from the previous two and give a worthy finale to their involvement in the franchise. And with the mostly spoiler-free sales pitch out of the way, let's take a deep dive into the film. Much like the previous installment, Saw 3 struggles to find its footing, as we begin with a clunky but ultimately necessary scene, as we see Detective Matthews in the wake of his abandonment in the bathroom. He finds the hacksaw, and takes a hint from Gordon's book, nearly resorting to cutting his foot off. Instead, he uses Adam's default weapon to break his foot. I mean, at least then it might heal. Okay, maybe not. Either way, Matthews is now free. The SWAT team cuts open a locked metal door to a trap that was in a classroom, and Carrie arrives shortly afterwards, expecting to find Matthews' corpse. It's not him this time, as Detective Hoffman describes the scene. Career criminal Troy has been more comfortable in chains than free, and now must break the chains that bind him. All he had to do was release himself from each of the chains. Yeah, Hoffman, all he had to do. As if he doesn't have a ring going straight through his jaw. While Troy puts up a valiant effort, time runs out and the bomb goes off. Eric's disappearance has really taken a toll on Carrie. She sees him everywhere, in fleeting glimpses, and even in her dreams. She says she can't forgive herself for what happened to him. Even with her head clouded with survivor's guilt, she is still sharp as ever on the job, correctly pointing out that this trap doesn't follow any of Jigsaw's previous. Even if Troy broke the chains that held him down, he was never escaping the room that imprisoned him. Carrie returns home that night, and studies the tape that Jigsaw made for Troy, when suddenly it changes to a live feed of herself, with the camera in the closet. She abides by her cop handbook and shoots first to ask questions later. There's no one in there, but there is someone behind her, as Pigmask attacks her. She wakes up sometime later strung up above the ground, leaking blood. Jigsaw says that up until now, she spent her whole life among the dead, so much so that she's dead inside. The device she finds herself in is hooked into her ribcage, and the only way to get out is to reach into the beaker of acid in front of her and fish out a key. 
And I get that in the heat of the moment, the frontal lobe takes the backseat to the primal brain, but come on, Carrie, you can easily pour some of this liquid out. Instead, she reaches in and grabs the key, unlocking the padlock. But all that does is open the small strap. The metal is still hooked into her ribs. Carrie sees somebody emerge from the shadows, and she accepts her fate. It's a harsh reimagining of the Blood Eagle torture method from Nordic lore. And with that, Detective Alice and Carrie perishes, leaving the series. And I'm not happy. I truly wish more than anything we got some more backstory of her. Maybe even a full storyline in one of these films. But, and not to spoil future entries too much, she never returns. Not even as a flashback. A character with so much potential. Vanquished. Now, I do think that Saw 3 has a bit of a bloated runtime, and we can certainly do without most of this opening 17 minutes or so. But finally we meet one of our main protagonists, Dr. Lynn Denlin, and we immediately find that her life is in shambles. She's jaded by her life, taking pills to numb herself, and her marriage is failing. And this bleeds into her work life, as her inaction nearly costs the kid their life. But at the heart of it all, she truly is a good doctor. As she goes to leave the locker room, she finds that the exit door is locked. As she tries to call somebody to let her out, she is attacked by Pignast. She wakes up to somebody in a black jacket coming in and turning on the lights, which is revealed to be Amanda. And allow me to break some narrative immersion here, but this is the hottest that Amanda's ever been. Are you gonna behave? Amanda wheels Lynn into the other room, where John Kramer lay with an oxygen mask. While she may not remember him, he certainly remembers her. John used to frequent Lynn's hospital, going to see his oncologist, Dr. Lawrence Gordon. Amanda takes a break from giving John his water to provide his medical records, so he can switch primary care doctors to Lynn. She reiterates what she told him before. His frontal lobe tumor is inoperable and unpredictable. John is tired of being spoken to like he's just another patient, just another statistic. Lynn won't even look at him. This sobers her up to the situation at hand, and she forewarns that he doesn't have long. Death is a surprise party. Then, almost out of nowhere, John just reads Lynn to Phil, before giving her the rules of the new game. Can she grant someone the gift of life, to save her own? Amanda places a collar around Lynn's neck, a beautiful industrial necklace with shotgun shell accoutrement. The collar itself is linked to John's heart, and if his life ends, so does hers. She has to keep John going until a man completes the test of his game. Then, and only then, can she go free. Speaking of, meet Jeff in his crate. He's become a hollow form of himself, consumed with hate and vengeance in the wake of the death of his son at the hands of a drunk driver. But through each of his tests, he will have a chance to forgive, and by the end, he will come face to face with the man responsible for the loss of his child. But will he forgive him? Jeff only has two hours to complete his game, so he tries to break out of his crate. Unfortunately, I don't think he's forklift certified, so he falls down, knocking his head pretty good. This grade 2 concussion gives him a flashback scene, one in which he practices his confrontation of his son's killer, akin to that of Travis Bickles in Taxi Driver. Jeff storms into his daughter's room, tearing up the place, looking for something. It's one of his son's possessions, that his daughter clutches onto. He rips it away from her, returning it back to its usual display place. His daughter comes into the room to apologize, and Jeff responds by saying, What do you think mommy would say if she saw us like this? Obviously ill-equipped to answer such a heavy question, the daughter leaves the room. But she just missed the show, as Pig Mask was behind the door the whole time, and attacks Jeff. As he stumbles through the halls, he comes across his first clue, open the door Jeff, with a ripped photo of himself and a key to accompany it. Amanda watches Jeff's progress on the CCTV footage, and reports his commencement to John, who's in the middle of testing. Lynn determines that his brain is herniating, and he absolutely has to get to the hospital. Amanda calmly tells her that that won't happen. John defuses the situation, saying that the rules of their game have been made clear, and she must abide by those rules. And after he steps in, he begins seizing. Lynn springs into action, begging Amanda to snap out of her shocked state and help her stabilize John. They don't have the Ativan that Lynn needs to help him, so John just has to ride it out until his vitals normalize. Amanda breaks, and Lynn goes to rub in the I told you so. But to her surprise, Amanda accepts that John needs the surgery, but on one condition. Okay. Do it here? <laughs> Lynn gives Amanda a laundry list of medical supplies that they'll need for the surgery, and she goes out to retrieve the goods. Jeff comes across the door, labeled Face Your Fears. 
He enters a walk-in freezer room, where a woman hangs naked in the center. She is alive, but clinging to life. Jeff finds his second tape, which informs him that the woman in front of him was present the day of his son's death, but did not testify. Now, Jeff holds her life in his hands. Only he can free her before she freezes to death. Which is exacerbated by her getting sprayed with some of those misters from the produce section at the store. Her pained cries fall on deaf ears. I didn't do anything to you! That's exactly it! You didn't do anything! After the fourth round of spraying, Jeff finally comes around, reaching for the key with his best Ariana Grande impression. Yeah. He wisens up, sacrificing a bit of his cheek flesh to grab the key. But it's far too late, as Danica's frozen. He exits the room, collapsing from exhaustion. He gets up to find a second message. One bullet will end it all. And on the back, another piece of his family photo, this time containing his late son. He adds a bullet to his inventory and pushes on. Lynn explores the jigsaw workshop, seeing the reverse bear trap on a mannequin head. It snaps closed, scaring her. As if that weren't bad enough, she got scared in front of the baddies. She tries to reason with her that John's surgery has such a small chance at succeeding, but Amanda's more worried about pointing out all the cool shit that Lynn could kill her with. Of course, that would mean that she likely dies as well, so she doesn't take her shot. Amanda plays it cool in front of Lynn, but when she's alone, she pulls out a box that triggers a memory. In a flashback, we see the creation and aftermath of her original test. Tearfully, Amanda updates John on Jeff's progress. John has Amanda go through his desk to find an envelope with her name on it. John is confident in her. Amanda tells him that Lynn's about to begin her procedure, and asks if he picked her because she's the best chance he has. That's one reason I chose her. Jeff continues to meander around the halls. Eventually he comes across Billy, laid out like his son's body. The next door says, time to let go. And once he enters, a man can be heard yelling for help. According to the message, it's the judge from the case, who sentenced the man who killed his son lightly. He's laid out on his back, restrained at the neck. In order to find the key to release him, Jeff must incinerate his son's belongings. And if that's not enough, rotting pig corpses begin moving, being dropped in a machine that liquefies them, spraying the judge with the juice. If Jeff continues to sit idly by, the judge will drown. After some time, he finally hits the button, and the key drops, which lets him free the judge. Lynn begins her preparations for John's surgery, and begins slicing his scalp open, exposing his skull. Even Amanda gets in on the fun, helping Lynn out. Once Lynn cuts through his skull, she cuts through the membrane, exposing the brain, releasing the pressure. As John begins testing his motor function, he crashes. As he begins his ascent into the afterlife, he remembers his fondest memory, a beautiful blonde woman. When he comes to, he believes that he's talking to her. This breaks Amanda even further. She opens up her kit, remembering a time when John demanded she give him everything. The marks on her arm are from a past life, a life she will leave behind. He hands her an envelope, and we see that it was Amanda who attacked Adam in a shithole apartment. Oh, uh, by the way, it's still Free Huey. Then we see that she helped set up the bathroom game. Amanda's been cutting again, hiding it on her thighs, where John wouldn't see. She can't bear to show him, show that his rehabilitation didn't work for her. Post-surgery, Lynn cleans up, looking longingly at her ring. Amanda gives John a nice hug, but Lynn has to spoil their moment. I can't hear you. Amanda's done taking a neighbor shit, choking her while she reaches for her gun. If John hadn't stepped in to scold her once more, who knows how it could have escalated. John knows Amanda. They're so much alike. He says that in the end, Amanda will be the closest he's ever come to a connection, to being understood. But he also knows that her emotion is her weakness. We get another flashback, this time after the bathroom game. She finds Adam's body, clinging to life, and takes it upon herself to put him out of his misery. We're back to Jeff, who's picked up a sidekick. Here's your chance, Jeff, one step closer to revenge. And he gets the clip for the bullet. Or, magazine. One of the two. The judge gives Jeff his condolences, but also says no amount of punishment would take his pain away, or bring his son back. Vengeance doesn't solve anything, it only makes the pain greater. He doesn't seem to be getting through to Jeff though, who kicks open the door to the next room, and his next trap. A man is trapped by his limbs and head, with a tape layer around his neck. As Jeff approaches him, their expressions show it all, they seem to know each other. The tape reveals him to be Timothy Young, the man who killed Jeff's son. He's now face to face with the man he wants to kill the most in the world. Timothy is trapped into Jigsaw's favorite trap, the rack, 
which will slowly twist each body part until it breaks. Jeff can free him if he grabs the key from the box, but with the caveat that he will take a shotgun blast to do so. The machine starts twisting, starting with the arm. Jeff just stands there, as Timothy's screams seep into his brain. The judge rebukes Jeff's inaction. He's killing Timothy. Is he a murderer? I want you to kill him every day. Maybe I am. Timothy screams. Jeff screams. It's not until both of his legs are broken that Jeff finally grabs the key, and the shotgun blasts the judge. Jeff's indolence catches up, and he never gets to use that key. As Timothy's head twists, breaking his neck, Jeff cries on his shoulder, forgiving him of his sins. John and Lynn converse, and Lynn expresses her desire to see her husband, even if their relationship is strained. This intrigues John. Matrimony always has. Husbands unable to look at their wives, wives cheating with strangers, people who bear children only to neglect them. Lynn takes exception with John's assertion, saying that her marriage has endured more suffering than he will ever know. You haven't seen anything yet. John and Lynn lock their hands, Lynn begging to be let free. Amanda walks in, only to be told to leave. John tells Lynn that if she makes it through this, she'll thank him one day, just as Amanda did. Amanda finally opens her envelope, and the contents of it distress her. Lynn once again asks to be let go, and John tells her that perhaps his life wasn't the one she was saving after all. He pours liquid wax over tape that says, play me, while inquiring about Lynn's family. He questions why she lives with the dead when she has a beautiful family, a husband who's endured pain, and a daughter who needs her mother. Amanda tells them that Jeff has completed the third test, and Lynn is free to go. John asks Amanda to undo Lynn's collar. Amanda refuses, and John tells her that Lynn is more important than she knows. Amanda cocks the gun, leaving John no other option than to remind her of the rules. Even with the gun, it's Lynn that holds Amanda's life in her hands. And she is disgusted by the idea. To her, Lynn doesn't deserve to go free. Is that how she feels about the other test subjects? We know how she handled Adam, and now we see how she took care of Matthews. Amanda finally turns on John. You do is no different than murder. You torture people. You watch them die. That's bullshit. Nobody changes. John reminds her, if you fail, we all fail. Succeed, we all succeed. Amanda doesn't believe she means anything to John. She's but a mere pawn in his twisted game. But to John, she means everything. Their fates are linked. She's supposed to be the heir to the legacy. I've tried to help you, Amanda. Oh, help me! Fix me, motherfucker! Why is she so important to you? John is brought to tears, seeing his apprentice turn. She's not important to me. She's important to you. Jeff receives his final piece, the rest of the gun. He enters the room, calling out to Lynn. As Lynn goes to investigate, <laughs> Lynn falls into Jeff's arms. Just destroyed four lives. Jeff shoots Amanda in the neck, and as she bleeds out, John reaches his hand out. This was Amanda's game all along. She was being tested. This was her last chance. John tried everything he could do to see Amanda succeed, but she couldn't. John cries, giving his most painful game over. Amanda Young is one of the most tragic characters in horror history. She struggled with abuse and addiction for a good portion of her life, only to be kidnapped and used as a guinea pig by a broken man a test case of fixing who he deems as society's worst. After she narrowly escapes, she is stalked by her tormentor and manipulated into following him. Jigsaw grooms her, taking advantage of her mental illness to craft an unfeeling, apathetic character. Amanda is Jigsaw's worst victim, simply because of how much she endures. In Saw 2, I praised Amanda due to how much she truly endures, but a double-edged sword is still dangerous. Her willingness to endure, to try and change her life for what she sees as better, after having been sold a vicious lie. We see Amanda finally break. We see her self-harm. She's relapsing. She wants to get better. Why can't she get better? The man she's built her new lease on life around is denying her affection, in a deliberate attempt to test her will, her loyalty to him, and his method. She sees him as a father figure. Why won't he love her? A cop slams her head into the wall, calling her worthless, a junkie bitch, nothing. 
It's a harrowing echo of the Japanese exploitation films that influenced Saw in the way that it frames the devaluation and suffering of women. But it is worth remembering that this is a film written by James Wan and Lee Winnell, two deeply empathetic filmmakers who are generally good at framing feminine trauma in an honest way. Amanda is created by the same man who would give us the Invisible Man remake. It feels more like a response to the trend of the feminine abuse films that influenced the series, a comment on it. It shows the deeply patriarchal place this sort of violence comes from. It depicts men psychologically breaking a woman until she rejects the rules of their fucked up games, and decides to end it all in a reckless, self-destructive fashion. She's been denied love. She's lost her only purpose. She's been groomed into aiding a serial killer set up his farcical tests. She's relapsed into all of her dark methods of self-harm and pathological lying. She's become morally bankrupt. She has nothing left. Why not just fucking end it all? And that's why I love Amanda, because she's reached that point. At this point, she truly has nothing. The cops won't help her. She can't escape Jigsaw. She can't save herself. Why not destroy everything in a final fuck you to a life lived in service of men and their cruelty? Why not bring this game to its logical, Shakespearean conclusion? It's almost as if she understands the game better than Jigsaw. Amanda understands that his justice is unjust, and realizes that by playing, somebody is automatically doomed. Finally, she has control. Saw 3 is incredible, because with Amanda, it pushes back against the shitty, morally punitive reads that people have had of the series. This is not just. There is no justice. Because Jigsaw has created a microcosm of mankind's cruelty, and unleashed it onto one of society's ultimate victims. Juan and Winnell, in what would be their final major contribution to the series, left us with a word of warning. To not be seduced by the seemingly wise words of a craven sociopath. Amanda's downfall is entirely his doing. And if we see fit to deliver corporal torture, we are the ultimate monsters. Jeff aims the gun at John. You haven't learned anything tonight, have you? Your rage and your vengeance will only hurt the ones you love. This is directed at Jeff, but I can't help but feel that this is introspective. John's rage and vengeance has caused the death of his closest connection in this world, and her final moments were scornful of his methods. John tells Jeff that right now, his daughter needs him most in life, like Amanda needed him. John taunts Jeff, saying, You can't kill me, Jeff. Jeff pulls the trigger. No bullets. Lynn and Jeff embrace. She hasn't much time left. John can get an ambulance for her in about four minutes and Jeff agrees. John gives him one final test. He gives Jeff free reign of all the medical equipment Amanda brought for Lynn. All he has to do is decide not to kill John. John ends his girl's speech by slightly altering his typical catchphrase. Live or die, Jeff. Make our choice. John's truly put his life into Jeff's hands. He has nothing left. His methods, his teachings, his lifestyle was all for naught. If Jeff kills him, he is released from his life of pain. If Jeff refrains, he will view it as his teachings working, rehabilitating. It's the ultimate win-win for John. Either way, he comes out for the better. I forgive you. He may forgive him, but his taste for vengeance knows no bounds, using the circular saw to slice John's throat. As John struggles to take his final breaths, the collar around Lynn's neck activates. John plays his final message for Jeff, indicating he planned for just this moment. John told Jeff that he couldn't kill him, but never the reason. John is responsible for the loss of his child. He kidnapped their daughter, and only he knows where she is. If Jeff wants to see her, he must play another game. Lynn's collar goes off, killing her instantly. Jeff has nothing left. That's the underlying motif throughout this film. There's a level of unrelenting nihilism that's seldom seen in Western cinema. The expressed humanitarianism of Jigsaw's mission to make people appreciate their lives has always been a farce revealed here to be a flimsy excuse for a sadist's desire to manipulate and break people. Unlike the previous films, none of the victims of the main trap can possibly save themselves, and the man being tested is hardly in any physical danger at all. Lynn is caught in this impossible mission to save an unsavable life. Jigsaw's morality is a hypocritical excuse for his desire to see people suffer as he has. This is a film dedicated almost exclusively to depicting the vulnerability of the human form. Human spirits and bodies can be destroyed by nothing more than a twist in circumstance perspective, or a physical twist of the arm. Calling this mere torture porn is missing the point. It's as focused on the sensational violence of the games as it is on John's sickness. He's cancer-ridden, a disease that is often random, meaningless to occur, causing him to seize and lose motor function. Jigsaw's own body is the trap in and of itself. 
Through this, fused with the literal traps, we are reminded persistently of the limitations of the human body, and what happens when our bodies are pushed to the very edge of life. Also getting as much, if not more screen time than the traps is the emotional sadness that is wrought from the unfeeling chaos of the world, which Jigsaw amplifies, rather than giving meaning and structure to people's lives, as he claims. This complements the core theme of vulnerability perfectly. We see a man, devastated by the unfairness of his son's death and lack of retribution, and Jigsaw's games just reiterate how his sadness holds him emotionally captive. Jigsaw, contrary to his expressed mission, does nothing to heal his test subjects. He actively makes his subjects' lives worse. Amanda's already the demonstration of his flawed intentions. Rather than Jigsaw's games rehabilitating her, she is still self-harming, and has more emotional turmoil than ever. She's been on a downward spiral ever since we first saw her in the first Saw, culminating here. But what makes all this misery work is that, unlike in something like Midsommar, the film doesn't pretend to care about these characters' lives and pain. In narrative analysis terms, we have no time to get acquainted with most of Jigsaw's victims, and the emotional connection between the leads that would make us invested in their success is a veil for twists only revealed in the film's conclusion. But this is not a flaw. By leaving no room for empathy, Saw 3 simply gives us a series of bodies breaking down in every way imaginable. Maybe that's all we are, a vessel for physical and emotional pain. I don't subscribe to that thought process, but the film's razor-sharp focus on exploring that theme is commendable, moving beyond something that could be considered into pure, abject misery. Thank you for watching.